Okay, so today we're going to, I'm going to talk about Harold Cohen and um, the computer program that he created to um, actually, it's an AI, artificial intelligence program that created drawings and paintings. Um, Cohen was a pioneer in computer-based art. The exhibition at the Whitney looks at the evolution of his Aaron software. And uh, this is basically the earliest artificial intelligence software for art making and one of the longest running contemporary art projects in this field. Fascinated by the computer's power and potential as an art making tool, Cohen devoted his life to pushing the boundaries of AI's possibilities and understanding what makes an image evocative. Throughout Cohen's decades long creative collaboration, with Aaron, the software underwent iterations that expanded its capabilities. Cohen focused on exploring AI as an instrument that translates artistic knowledge and process into code while creating an autonomy. Basically, the program itself generated the images that that you see before you. Um, the artist and his work are a crucial bridge between the worlds of art and engineering. So. Um, Okay, he was born in London, 1928. Um, and uh, he was the son of Polish, Russian, Jewish parents, was educated at the Slade School of Fine Arts, which actually, um, oh God, what's his name? Hockney and, and several other really well-known artists were in, in, the school when he was there. Um, he represented Great Britain at the Venice Biennale in 1966. This was before he became involved in the uh, computer generated art. So he actually was quite um, established in his career as a painter before he got involved in creating the um, the program and working with the computer as a as a, a generative um, art creator um, so Cohen um, was later given the rank of professor at UC San Diego. He went for he went for like a one year uh, stint. He was teaching at Slade. He went to went to California for one for a one year residency and ended up staying for I believe it was about three decades right there. Um, Cohen taught at. UC San Diego from 68 to 94. After his retirement, he continued to work on Aaron and produced new artwork in a studio. Um, all right, uh, family life. Well, actually he was married uh, and had, I believe he has, had five children. I'm not 100% certain about that, but there's a whole slew of people that that 
uh, came out of came out of that 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 marriage, uh, whether they are um, his children or grandchildren. There's a whole list of people that that uh, that basically are part of part of his group, shall we say? Um, Cohen's work on Aaron began in 1968 at the University of California. He initially wrote Aaron in C programming, whatever the heck that means, uh, a language that eventually um, converted to Lisp, which means nothing to me, but may mean something to some of you. Uh, <laughs> um, shall we say, he continued to um, uh, evolved this programming through, throughout his career. Okay. And I'm going to jump way forward and, and show you this image. This is late in his career. This is like from uh, 2007. Um, he died in 2016. Um, I'll go into more depth on how um, he developed this program later on in the talk, but I just wanted to give you a taste of where we're going. Um, Cause it, it took us, you know, a good 20 years to get there. So uh, these are images from the fifties, um, more or less when he just got out of, out of college. Um, and they're lovely paintings, actually. They're very, very expressive and interesting pieces. And this is 1961. Um, again, you know, color field abstraction, the, the abstract expressions were going on in the United States. He was still in, in England at this time. Um, you know, there are a number of people that were involved in kind of minimalist work, um, textural and minimal color. People like Bryce Martin, Barnett Newman, using these bands of, of, of color. Interesting piece, texture. Something that I'm going to plug away at throughout this talk is the mark making. And if you look at the textures in this, you can see very subtle, but definite, you know, marks and scrapes and, and, and linear elements of, of different kinds. Um, one of the things he was interested in is, uh, how we perceive depth on a two-dimensional surface. So, um, you know, you can see the overlaps and, and how the, um, the images interact with each other. It's, it's a really interesting kind of almost random assortment of, of, of objects or, or images um, but there is this business of, of surface and depth. How do you, how do you delineate depth on a two-dimensional surface? So the search, you know, the mark making, the layering, the grouping of shapes, um, this this dark area on the on the left looks like it's spray paint. So he's he's experimenting with different ways of making marks and um, uh, very limited color range. You know, it's really red, blue, a little bit of green, and black and white. So um, 
long before Cohen became a pioneer of computer art at age 38, he was a painter with a well-established career and one of those and one of those selected to show at the 33rd Biennale, Venice Biennale in 1966. The Venice Biennale was an exhibition of international contemporary art. At that time, um, there, there were 36 uh, countries participating. There's more now. Um, but this piece is, is, is a really interesting piece to explore a little bit. Um, It, it really overlaps a little bit into, into very rudimentary mark making. Um, it, you know, there's sections of it that, you know, it almost looks like finger painting that the, the, the green blob, um, you, you almost see fingerprints sliding up underneath, underneath it. Now this is a collage. So, in fact, let me let me do this. I'm going to zoom in a little bit on this so that you can see that this is twine that's been dipped in, in paint and adhered to the surface. And then these blue lines, I think some of them are twine and some of them look to me like you just took a, a tube of paint and closed it directly on. So these are you know, just direct paint out of the tube adhered to the canvas. And then there's the splatters and the mark making. One of the things that, that he was interested in was the kind of rudimentary elements of, of image making. And I was going to actually grab a cave painting and put it on the same page with this, because that's really what it reminded me of. He's trying to get to some really fundamental mark making notions. And this again is how do we think about making marks? How do we think about doing a drawing? How do we think about creating a piece of art? This is, this is something which he has to, has to break down a lot more when he gets into the 60s and tries to work with coding a computer. So these are, these are things he was thinking about at that time. Okay. And this is from 1965. So he's experimenting with technology. The, this is a, a screen print. So um, there, were, there were a lot of people that were working with screen printing at the time, um, uh, Warhol. Screen printing is, is really, was known as a commercial um, media. Um, so again, this is, this is um, looking at, at kind of, a close-up of mark making, um, kind of bringing it up to the surface. You know, these little squiggles down below, um, very similar motif to what was in here up in, up in the upper left-hand corner in those little squiggles that, that are down at the bottom right. And, okay, close-up. So one of the things that I get out of this is kind of the, the Bende um, marking that happens uh, when you look at a, um, a magazine or a reproduction um, in, in a newspaper, it's broken down into dots. And so this is, this is really taking that and pulling it out um, 24 by 24 inches. So he's taking maybe a square inch of an image and making it large. Um, and the, the lithograph on the, on the left is again, um, 
that kind of expanded. Um, I was thinking about Roy Lichtenstein when I looked at these because he he did use that a lot in his in his cartoon um, uh, cartoon like paintings. He would take those that dot uh, and bring it up to the surface, and I'm sure Harold was was quite aware of of that, but pursuing it in a different in a different way because it was really not this is really not about pop art this is really about the mark making and what is it doing okay so by 1971 he um he has begun to think about how to use the computer as, as a vehicle to, to make art. He um, studied programming. You know, when he, when he got to San Diego in 68, he started to really dig into pro learning how to program the computer. Um, on the lower left-hand side of this image, you see what he calls the turtle. It's a it's a robot that that actually has wheels on it that crawls around on the surface of the canvas or paper or whatever, and and has a marker in it and actually makes the drawings. And he programmed the computer to. carry on on its own to make these marks. So they start off as rather random and limited, but the computer actually accumulates this knowledge, this, this, ex this experience in a way. Um, now, nowhere in this is anything visual for the computer. The computer does not have does not see what it's doing. It it is, in fact, if you look at the image down on the lower right hand corner, you see in the corners of this image, you see these red blocks. It actually was being run on on sonar, from my understanding. Basically, the the um, there was some kind of a little beeper mechanism on the on the turtle itself that would beep when it was done making a mark, and these four um, uh, microphones in the four corners would pick up on the location of where the turtle was and give it give that information to the computer, and the computer would set the turtle off in a different direction to create more lines. Now, these were, you know, rather random, but there, there was a, a, a cumulative methodology that was, that was being developed there. Um, and this is, this is what Cohen was not programming this to make these lines. He was programming it to have it accumulate knowledge and create its own drawings. Um, let, let, me, let, me, let me move on to the next, but one of the other things is he also wanted it to be as close as possible to how human beings actually draw. So if you look at the image at the, at the upper right-hand corner, you see that kind of jagged line. You see it's not a, a straight mechanical line. It really does, um, it's very sensitive to directionality. And, and 
it has that kind of wavering quality to it. Here is um, you know, a full picture of, of those couple of marks there. And, and you see that there is something going on here. There's a spatial relationship between these marks. There is, again, this business of the figure ground. I put up the 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 face and the the um, and the chalice image to remind you of something that I've been plugging away at with with all of this the figure ground relationship of these marks on this drawing are really interesting and really you know interactive the whites and the black marks how the white spaces are activated by the by those black marks by those black lines so again the the jaggedness of the marking really makes this a really for me a much more interesting image than than if it were a really straight um geometric linear element um okay As I said, the computer cannot see. So, so in fact, what it's doing is 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 looking at the data that it's gathering in 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 computer language, um, and it's it's actually making these making these spaces out of out of that algorithm that it's developing. Uh, I, got, I got to say that, that, that this, this has been quite a stretch getting to know uh, the programming, the idea, the, the ideas behind the programming. Um, after studying how children draw, examining Native American petroglyphs, interviewing artists, Mr. Cohn developed algorithms that allow the computer to draw lines with the irregularity of a freehand drawing. So here you, here you see, you know, this is from 1977, this is from 1971. So the development of form, the interaction of shape, is 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 beginning to become more organic, more um, representational in a way. If you look at the, you know, there's kind of bird-like shapes, and there's these stones, and and you can see um, the fundamental business of of kind of creating roundness of form the, this hatching that's on these on these pebble like shapes gives you a sense of volume so the computer is is actually integrating this knowledge of a volume into into its into its repertoire of marks. Now, how does how does Harold Cohen come into this as an artist? These these prints are um, actually he sees the visual programming. He sets up the, the computer to devise these drawings while he's sleeping, you know, while he's off doing other things. The, the, the computer can be creating these drawings. Harold comes back to it, looks at what's been, what's been generated in, within the computer and decides which ones he thinks are worth printing. Not all of them turned out. Great. Well, you know, hey, that's the artistic process. Um, really interesting. 
um, the the kind of this is the beginning of overlaps too. If you look at you know this back here, you don't see any overlapping forms. Here you start to see overlapping forms. Um, they're clusters um, and shape relationships. And really, this was running without Harold overseeing what was going on with the computer. The computer was generating these things without him. Um, and what Basically, the drawings were being created. Harold would come in and hand color these these pieces. Um, and this starts to create, this was from 1974. Um, and, and basically, he kind of emphasizes the overlaps and creates more of a sense of dimensionality in these in these clusters of shapes okay um so you said it hand colored in 1982 uh this appears to be one of the original computer drawings for a series of prints that cohen created for a one-man show in I'm not even going to try and pronounce the name of that museum in Amsterdam uh, in 1977-78. At the time, his Aaron computer program was only able to produce monochrome line drawings. According to the artist, the image created in 1977 was subsequently hand colored, then signed and dated by him in 1982. The museum also holds a black and white version of the print. Um, so you see basically the development of, of, of these ideas. Now, one of, one of his goals was really to have the computer uh, develop and paint the, the pieces. You see in this thing, again, you know these kind of bird-like shapes and 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 the beginnings of kind of flower-like um, configurations. So he was not alone in these ideas. Solowit was actually writing his paintings and writing programming for human beings to, to complete those drawings. You see in, in the wall drawing on the left where these two participants, artists, gallery people, who knows who they are, uh, may have been students, um, are creating these arcs and, and freehand drawing lines According to his instructions, he writes all the stuff out for them to follow, and they actually execute the drawing. Um, and again, um, the piece on the right is another one where where basically there are these arcs of color were basically he instructed people as to which color, what layer to put those on, how many of them, um, uh, the distance that they were to cover, how much pressure to put on, on the marker. Um, really interesting stuff. So Solowit was programming human beings to make these marks where Harold Cohn was programming the computer to make the marks. And here is, here is uh, Solowit wall drawing 
executed in 1975. Again, you know, the, the handmade marks were very important to the quality of what this, what this thing was. Um, and that they're, you know, they're scripted performances. And let's see, I'm going to do a close up on this because actually um, lines of one inch, four directions, four colors. This is a lithograph. Um, and let me see if I can do the, the zoom in. It's not exactly the clearest of, of images, but you get some idea. The, the, the instructions are uh, also included in this print. So you can follow what exactly is going on here. You know, yellow vertical, black horizontal, red diagonal. Um, so this is something that was, that was actually, you know, really going on in the, in the, in the sixties and seventies, um, kind of minimalist conceptual work. Um, this is the Andy Warhol that's up at the DIA. Uh, this is actually a photograph of a shadow in the corner of one of this of of his studio that was blown up. I believe these things are about six feet by four feet um, each increment. And you know, one of the things that Warhol was was doing with this was kind of a tongue in cheek version of a of a Franz Klein. These great gestures, great existential gestures. Well. Uh, I can do the same thing with silkscreen. <laughs> um, but it's, it's, it's actually, when you go and see the piece, it's quite a, um, uh, effective and, and powerful piece when you're in the room with these. Um, and again, this is that increment. This is the, it's silkscreen. It's not directly painted on there. Um, uh, there's that, there's this element of, of the concept leading the image. Okay. And here we are, 1977, again, from that, the, that Amsterdam suite. Um, and on the right, you have 1985, this untitled piece. And what I'm going to say is you can begin to see the development of the figural elements in, in the piece on, on the right. Um, it, there's a lot more overlap going on, uh, a lot more depth in, in the marks overlapping one another, but there's also the cubes that are here the little, the rectangles um, give you some kind of a sense of depth and per, a perceived sense of perspectival space in, in the piece. Okay, we're back to 77 and then the, this 1980 Aaron drawing again, much more saturated the the um the sense of of roundness from the the mark making from the hatching um the fun i mean you know look at this this kind of this thing on the on the on the right basically you see that little kind of eyeball thing that's happening and that fish the red shape that's in the center, it's kind of a fish-like form. Um, you know, they're really buoyant and, and playful. Uh, that's hand, this is hand-colored. We haven't gotten to the computer do, doing the coloring yet.
Okay. And uh, this is from 19, the one on the, the right is from 1981. It's, it's um, dyes that, that he's using. That this, is, this is basically the, the beginning implication of where we're going with creating a, a plotter that can actually translate color and create color out of the computer. But he hasn't gone there yet. This is not this is an experiment with 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 the dyes on cotton. Um, on the left you see actually forms that were produced by Aaron that were um, I believe um, projected and drawn in. And then, and then this is uh, Cohen up there actually coloring in the forms. So he did a number of very large scale murals. He did one in California that was, I believe, 12 by 100 feet long. Uh, <laughs> he got around. Okay, hand-colored computer drawing. So Cohen allowed the computer to generate the image, um, you know, basically producing images all night long. He would cull through them and decide which ones to print. The machine was not able to see. It does not make aesthetic decisions at this point. Um, there's no camera. There's no visual um, uh, input for the computer to make color choices or to even make shape choices. Those, those shape choices are made inside the machine and transferred onto the surface. And here we have these forms taking shape. 1981, 1986. So he was working on creating these, these anatomical um, elements and putting them together, programming them into the computer to create these. So he had to program the computer to understand that these forms put together would create figures, human figures. And again, uh, I'm not sure the date on this one, but this is, this is, I believe, still hand colored. We haven't gotten to the point where the computer's doing the coloring yet, but that's a whole other, other thing. Okay, and here we are, 1995. By this point, he has um, uh, created a a plotter, and on the on the right, you can see this little um, uh, kind of stamp that's that's his brush, and it it actually injects the dye into, into that, that little pad and transfers it onto the paper or canvas. Um, it's pretty amazing how much control there actually is from that, from that kind of pad that's transferring the ink. Um, One of the things that he really wanted to do is have, have that painterly quality, that actual you know, handmade quality be part of what the 
the, the computer actually did. Now, I'm not even going to begin to boggle your minds with the amount of work that it took him to figure out how to regulate the color in the program. Um, suffice it to say, he broke it down into hue, lightness or darkness, and saturation intensity. Um, so the hue is the color. The lightness and darkness is really important to how much um, uh, pigment went in, but what mixture of pigment went in. Um, and then there's, then there's the saturation or the intensity of the, of the color. Um, and that basically finding ways to gray down the color or brown out the color and, and make that, make that work in language that the computer could understand is just one amazing feat. Um, and here you have, you know, the results of, of, of one of those very saturated at this point. Um, but th using these pads is very different from the inkjet. I mean, you know, we, we all have these color inkjet printers and all that. It's very different mark making than, than um, what he gets out of this, this um, flatbed um, plotter that he's created. I mean, this, this piece looks like a, you know, it's got this translucency. Um, it really has a watercolor-like quality to the, the pigmented inks. The translucence, luminosity in the thing is amazing. All right, I'm I'm going to keep moving along here a little bit faster because I've got a lot to get through and uh, there's a lot more to come. Um, you know, the complexity of 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 the of the 2001 drawing with the plant behind it and the hand colored one on the left from 1992. I wanted to put those up next to each other so that you could see them. Um, and again, the one on, on, the, on the right is computer colored. It figured out the color scheme. And one of the things that, that Cohen would say is he would come in in the morning, he would look at these hundred or so drawings or paint ideas for paintings in the computer and and just would be boggled by some of the really amazing color choices that the computer made. Some of them worked, some of them didn't, some of them worked better than others, but they are really buoyant and joyful things. I mean, you know, what whatever he programmed into that computer, he programmed some heart in there. And this is, again, you know, this kind of interior, exterior thing, the big portrait and, and this kind of view out the window. Uh, So out of one of those sessions where this, this um, computer would create all these images, maybe 20 or 30 of them turned out to be ones that were, that were really worth printing in, in Cohen's opinion. And this is where Cohen as an artist comes into it. Basically, he is making those aesthetic choices that, the, that although this is an AI machine, that that is developing its in, its intelligence as it as it creates more and more of these prints 
understanding overlaps and tendrils and all that, you know, one of the things that Cohen did was, was program into it how plants grow, you know, leaves, tendrils, stems, overlaps, and the variation in, in, the, in the different colors and leaves and all of that is stuff that he programmed into the computer. But what those color choices are and the variations in that were things that the program created. And again, you can see um, 1995, 2007, the, I, I mean, I love the simplicity of the one from 1995, but you can see how, how complex and how much more um, uh, variation in color and in form came over time. And on the left is uh, Socrates' garden. This is actually an earlier piece, but it's 18 by 23 feet. Um, uh, and it was, it was hand colored um, using the forms, the kind of organic forms that, that he had been working with. And on the right is the, the computer generated image, actually computer generated color and all of that. Now, one of the things that Cohn came to, and this is in 2012, um, there's a subtlety to the, the human hand that, that he wanted to bring back into these pieces. So what he would do is print these out in color and then work over them, actually got his oil paints back out and, and started to actually paint back into them to increase the depth. He would paint with oil paints over the pigmented inks. And here's another late piece. Um, if you go to uh, www.aaronshome.com, there's videos, um, interviews with, with Cohn. There are talks that he gave, and there's actually a whole slew, I mean, probably 30. Um, papers that, that he wrote that, that were scripts for lectures that he gave. And they're really, really wonderful and insightful. And one of the things that he was fundamentally involved in is what is this creative process? How is it that, that this intelligence can be generated inside a machine how is it generated inside a human being? What is this all about? And these really incredible questions were things that he pursued in at, over the years and tried to come up with some interesting answers, generated more questions out of those. And there are a lot of AI programs out there now. These are you know, four or five that that I that I picked up. There there are some wonderful ones that are kind of data collections. But the difference between a data collection and and an AI creative generating machine that is what Aaron is is very different. Um, these. These programs here are taking information and, and doing, doing variations on those things, 
where Aaron is creating new work out of nothing, out of its memory, out of its developed experiential memory, <laughs> if you if you if you will. Um, so these are interesting gizmos, and and there's a lot of this AI stuff out there. Um, not a lot of it has the kind of heart that Harold Cohen brings to it. So I am going to leave you with that. Um, next, the next talk I'm going to do is on um, uh, Kath Kalowitz, a uh, wonderful printmaker and, and uh, Ger German expressionist um, who is going to have a show on... At, I believe it's at MoMA, uh, but tune in in a couple of weeks and you'll find out. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. This was amazing. I mean, the way he evolved in in the the shapes and and the colors, he's quite a color field artist. I yeah. Think. Well, I actually, Aaron is the color field artist. <laughs> oh, <right. laughs> well. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, stay safe tomorrow. Although if you can, you can come to the program we have at two o'clock at Chappaqua Performing Arts Center. It's free and open to the public. You'll see a lovely film and then a Q&A with the director, writer, and uh, performer, and then a small reception. And then next to, next uh, Saturday, the Disaster Preparedness Program. Obviously, I didn't know that the Disaster prepared this program would be needed today but <laughs> so be it. all right see you all again and don't okay. forget to go to our website chapacolibrary.org bye everyone bye john <laughs>